Would you pay a stranger to pray for you? The, uh, in 2011, uh, the prayer center began and they uh, offered prayers for anywhere from $9 to $35 for uh to, to submit a to submit a prayer request and they offered promised fraudulently that the uh, prayer center staff would pray for them so over the course of their existence four years they received 125,000 prayer requests uh, bilked people for over two million dollars doesn't that sound incredible who would pay a stranger to pray for them Yet, I see it all the time on Facebook, Twitter, uh, posts, uh, pray for my dying mother, pray for my job interview, uh, pray for, you know, me at 6 p.m. tonight, please, uh, pray for, you know, it, you know, it's just people just hoping someone, somewhere, will lift up a request to God for them. Now, it's a good desire. It shows that we believe there is a God. We believe that prayer helps us access his power. Uh, but why do we find it so hard to pray ourselves, for ourselves or for other people? Most people I know uh, say that they do not pray enough. Last thing I did before I went to bed last night, I got on my knees and I confessed to God I don't pray enough. Even though I'm talking about prayer this morning. That was, those are my last words last night. Jesus found time to pray. He prayed after he fed the 5,000. He went up on a mountain and prayed long into the night. Uh, after he'd healed a leper and many sick people, he went away by himself alone to pray. He prayed through the night when he was going to select the 12 disciples. Before he went to the cross, he prayed long into the night in Gethsemane. He prayed before big decisions, after big victories, before temptations. In Luke 11, after Jesus had done this, of his off praying, he came back and his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And he responded by teaching them uh, the Lord's Prayer. Think you could fumble through the Lord's Prayer with me? I didn't put it on the PowerPoint. Here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It's the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Boy, if you can't even get your pastor to know it, we're, we're in trouble. Wow. Then he taught them a parable. Uh, Jesus was a master storyteller. Then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. And a friend, of, a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children are in bed. I can't give up and give you anything. Picture it. The man and his family have gone to sleep. A typical, typical Middle Eastern house was one room where the family would eat and hang out during the day. Then at night, they would go up to a loft where they would sleep, and they... Uh, uh, would often bring their animals in to the lower level. So they're all asleep, and there's a knock on the door. So this guy puts on his robe and comes down the loft stairs, works his way through the cattle and the sheep and the chickens. Everybody's awake now. He opens the crossbar over the front door. It creaks and there's a guest there from out of town, a friend of his. Well, what to do but to invite him in. He invites him in. Of course, they have to feed him. He goes to the cupboard and to his shock, he finds there's no food. 
Well, what to do? I guess I'll have to go ask the neighbor. Will he help me? Well, I don't know, but we'll find out. Now, his neighbor has a family too, but he has even younger kids. Remember when kids were babies and how difficult it would be to get a baby to go to sleep? You hum to them, sing them a song, read them a story, get another drink of water, you know, finally get them asleep. Well, that's just, just what happened with his neighbor. He finally has everybody asleep. And this guy comes at the worst possible time. It's dark out. And this neighbor's two-story house is dark. But he comes over, rings the doorbell, ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. The man's chihuahua wakes up. He has this, who do you think you are, uh, bark, ruff, ruff, ruff. He can just kind of imagine what's going on inside, upstairs. His wife is kicking him. Hey, get up, there's somebody at the door. Poor guy, he was sound asleep. Now he's kicked out of bed. All the kids are awake again. comes downstairs finally the porch light goes on opens the door boy does he look bad boxer shorts t-shirt bed hair whiskers all over his face he says what are you doing here he said I got a friend who just came from out of town and I don't have any food to serve him Hank grumbles and complains oh come on come on Hank you gotta help me So he finally brings him in and takes him over to the cupboard and the refrigerator and the man fills up his basket and he goes home. He's able to feed his guest. He fed his guest because he was willing to go and ask for his neighbor. This is praying for someone in its purest. You say, God, you're good. I don't have what I need to give this person, but you do. Prayer is so important. Prayer is so powerful. So why do we find it so difficult to pray? Why do we find it hard to take time to pray? I can think of at least four reasons. We have a hard time taking time to pray. One, we don't recognize God is our only hope. We embrace the misguided notion that we can handle our own problems. We can take care of most stuff. Maybe God for the emergencies. We try everyone and everything else before admitting God is our only hope. James, Jesus' kid brother, says, you do not have because you do not ask God. The friend at midnight was not proud. He came late at night because he desperately needed help. There are people who on their journey come to us And they need our help. We may be the only Christian they know. They maybe work with us. Maybe they go to school with us. Maybe they live in the neighborhood by us. Listen to the plaintive words of the host. I have nothing to set before him. His words echo our own uh, desperation in in the life and death responsibilities God has given us. Lord, my neighbor is dying of cancer. I have nothing to set before him. Lord, my neighbor's marriage is breaking up. I have nothing to set before her. Lord, my teenage son is facing this severe temptation. I have nothing to set before him. None of us has the resources to meet these needs. That should drive us to God in prayer. Jehoshaphat was a man who understood his need for God. He was the king of Judah, and armies from all the nations around gathered against him, the Munites, the Ammonites, the Moabites. It'd be sort of like Israel today with Iran and Hezbollah gathered around them. What did, jo- what did Jehoshaphat do? He didn't do a crash military buildup program. He didn't go to Egypt for help. He just brought all the people together with their wives and children And he said, our God, will you not judge them? 
for we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. Our eyes, but our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Would, those, would that those words fall from the lips of every Christian. God, we don't know what to do in this situation, but our eyes are upon you. Only as we see him as our only hope do we become people of prayer. Another reason we find it hard to take time to pray is because we do not fully understand how much God loves us. Many people miss the point of this parable. Their thinking goes something like this. Guy comes and knocks. Guy doesn't want to give it up. He says, I can't get up. We're all asleep. Get out of here. But he keeps knocking and finally the guy opens up and gives him what he needs. Likewise with God, keep asking, keep persisting, and God will, you'll eventually wear God down and he'll give you what you want. That misses the whole point of the parable. To understand the point of the parable, you always look for the point of what? Surprise. The surprise in this, in order, in order to understand the surprise in this parable, you have to understand Middle Eastern hospitality. In the Middle East, when a guest arrives, you have to feed them. It would be unconscionable not to feed your guest. It's such a big deal that the whole village would assume responsibility with you to help you with that. So when Jesus says, the guy says, go away, we're asleep, I can't help you. That's the surprise. They're saying nobody would do that. Nobody would not help out. And then Jesus draws a contrast. He says, if your neighbor who's tired wouldn't help you. And he eventually gets up and gives you all that you need. How much more God, who never grows tired or sleepy and who loves you unconditionally, how much more will he give you what you ask? And then Jesus adds an application. Verse 9, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He says, if children... Your children ask you for an egg or a fish. You're not going to give them a snake or scorpion, would you? Of course not. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit? This is in Luke's uh, version that I'm reading. Uh, Jesus has the same parable in Matthew. In Matthew, he says, how much more, if, you're, if you, being evil, give good gifts, how much more will your Father in heaven give you good gifts? Here, Luke says, how much more will your Father give you the Holy Spirit? He gives us his presence, the Holy Spirit, to live in us, who gives us all good things. So I think, essentially, they mean the same thing, good gifts, Holy Spirit. This is probably one of the greatest passages in the Bible to help us understand unanswered prayer. We pray for a dying spouse or parent or child not to die. We pray to get a certain job. We pray to get together with a certain person, dating relationship. And our prayers aren't answered. And we say, what's wrong with God? Why won't he give me a break? Well, in this passage, Jesus says, God only gives good gifts. Maybe what we're asking for is not a good gift. Maybe it's not the best. Maybe he has something better. That, you know, maybe we're asking for a snake or a scorpion. God's not going to give us that just because we asked. Maybe he's got something better for us. Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, Lord, if possible, Father, if possible, take me going to the cross from me. That's going to be so terrible. Please, if we can do it any other way. What did the Father say? He said no. And so Jesus submitted to the Father and trusted him and went ahead and died on the cross. As a result of that, God gave us all salvation. 
Jesus won the victory over sin and death and evil. The end of my senior year in college, I began dating a girl. It was right here at Valley Presbyterian Church in Raleigh Hills. And she became a leader, worked with me. I was head of the youth program there in the summers. And um, we had a great relationship. And, and then I went off to seminary in Chicago. And um, I sort of assumed that things continued the way they were, we would get married. So I came back and, you know, we did phone calls and letters and stuff like that. And then uh, uh, I came back for Christmas. We had a wonderful four days together. Then the final night we were exchanging our Christmas gifts. And she says, I think we need to put the brakes on the relationship. I said, all right. I assumed, you know, she wanted to kind of tap on the brakes a little bit and slow it down. I learned uh, shortly thereafter that she meant full stop. So I went back to uh, Chicago and I was sad, I was depressed, and I was praying every day, Lord, help me get back to be- get together with her. Lord, we were so right for each other, please. After a month or almost two months of that, me feeling sorry for myself, one day I was reading this parable and, uh, where he says, God only gives good gifts. And I thought, you know, I'm pleading with you to pull this relationship back together, it's obviously not happening. Maybe that's not the best thing. Maybe you've got something better for me. Maybe you want me to be single. Or maybe you've got a better person for me. And so I quit my little pity party and decided to trust God. A couple months later, Jory came into my life. She's far better for me. She's been a, she's a dream wife. When I met her, her husband had just died of cancer. Just got married. He's diagnosed with inoperable spinal cancer. And a well-meaning Christian, after he died, said to Jory, you know, he wouldn't have needed to die if you would have just had faith. Wow. She's already grieving, and now she's told she's a bad Christian. It's an old refrain... If you just believe hard enough, if you just pray enough, if you just read your Bible enough, if you tithe enough, if you obey God enough, he'll give you whatever you want. But that's not the deal Jesus offers us. That's a way of kind of by our own morality trying to control God to get whatever we want. The offer he makes us is I will give you my Holy Spirit. He'll live within you. I'll have you, me with you wherever you go. He doesn't promise that you'll never have a family member die. He doesn't promise that you'll never get sick. He doesn't promise that you'll never lose your job, have a financial setback. But he promises to always be with you. Do you get it? God himself is the greatest gift. Another reason we find it hard to make time to pray is because we do not appreciate the power in interceding for other people. The man in the parable interceded for his friend. He wasn't hungry. His friend was. When we intercede for people, we're saying to God, God, my friend is sick and dying. I don't know what to do for him. I look to you. My friend's marriage is breaking up. I don't know how to help. I look to you. My friend is discouraged and depressed. I don't know how to help him. I'm turning to you. Intercessory prayer is not rocket science. It acknowledges our inability and God's ability. When people come together to pray, God moves. Max Lucado, in his book, Before Amen, tells about being invited by John Maxwell to speak at his church, Skyline Church, in Southern California. Max said, I'll do it on one condition. You tell me your best advice for how to grow a church. John says, deal. So what's the advice? Prayer. 
you recruit 120 prayer partners to pray for the church, for you and your family every day. So Max went home to his church in Austin, Texas and recruited 120 prayer partners. He said by the end of the year, the attendance was higher than it ever been. The children and youth programs were up better than they'd ever been before. New people had become Christians. People had been healed. The church was more united than ever before. We commit ourselves to pray. We pray with other people and God promises to work. Freddie Vest knows about that better than anyone. Also in the same book, Before Amen, Lakato tells about Freddie. He was a square-jawed cowboy who was in the fourth round, Graham, Texas, calf roping competition. Fell off his horse. He hit the ground and he went unconscious immediately. His heart stopped. His friend came down and held his head in his hands and began to pray for him. A, a veteran firefighter began doing CPR on him. The friend asked everybody in the stands to pray for Freddie. The place became kind of like a sanctuary and Freddie was on the altar. They couldn't get him to breathe, come back to life. 45 minutes later, an ambulance rushed him to the hospital. But Freddie said, you know, I could see the people praying for me. He said the whole experience, I could feel like I was in God's presence, like he was holding me, and it was so peaceful. And God allowed me to see the prayers. For, it was like one bolt of light going to heaven, then three, then five, then ten, then it was fifty, then it was like a hundred bolts of light, then it was like a thousand. And all of a sudden they came together in heaven and it was so bright, made such a flash that God sent me back. He had the experience of actually seeing what people's prayers looks like in heaven. <clears throat> That's the power of prayer together. You join together with other people and ask God for help and bam! Bam! Fire falls from heaven. At the end of my message, I'm going to ask you if you'd like to be my, a prayer partner with me, to pray every day for the church, for me and my family. Or I'll give you another option. You could be a prayer partner by joining me on Wednesdays with the prayer team. The only advantage of that one is uh, uh, you get to hear more. You get to hear from me what I think the issues are and what we need to pray for. There's also an opportunity this Tuesday. Franklin Graham is coming to Salem for a prayer rally 12 noon at the Capitol North Steps if you'd like to go down for that. One last reason we find it hard to pray <clears throat> is because we give up far too quickly. What if the friend at midnight had given up when there was no stirring in the house when he knocked on the door? He would have gone home empty-handed. But he kept knocking. Jesus says in verse 9, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Ask is in the present tense. It means keep on asking, keep on knocking. A man said to a friend, he was holding a flower, he said, what kind of flower is that? He said, it's a chrysanthemum. He said, are you sure? I think that's a rose. No, I'm pretty sure that's a chrysanthemum. Really? Okay, spell it. Uh, K R I S S. No, C R I S. No, K H R Y. You know what? I think you are right. I think it is a rose. How we are like him, so quick to give up. God says, keep on praying. Keep on asking me. You can't be sure I'll give you exactly what you ask because you don't always know best. You don't always know my will. But I will give you a good gift. So don't ever stop asking. 
My assistant, Chris Langley, handed me a, a thing this week. Seven minutes with God. I'm always saying, you know, we need to pray and uh, you need to read the Bible and do these journals. And, you know, a lot of times people don't do it because they think it's such a big deal and they don't have time. This says seven minutes. Breaks it up like this. One half minute preparing your heart. Say, God, here I am. Spend seven minutes with you. Prepare me. Teach me by your Holy Spirit. And then four minutes listening to God. That's when you read the Bible. That's when you, maybe you do a couple questions out of the journal. Just say, God, you know, I'm listening to you for four minutes. Then two and a half minutes talking to God. And they suggest break it up into the acrostic, A-C-T-S, Book of Acts. Adoration, you praise God for who He is, for something. Confession, you confess your sins of yesterday or that day. T, thanksgiving, you thank Him for what He did for you that day or yesterday. And then supplication, that's when you actually pray for yourself and intercede for other people. Not that complicated. If you do that, I'm guessing you'll look forward to that time so much each day that that seven might increase to ten. The time really doesn't matter. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your son Jesus telling such amazing stories that help us get it and that you want us to pray and that when we pray, you do give good answers. You love us. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to God in just silent prayer right now. Maybe your commitment today would be, yeah, I give up too quickly. I need to keep praying. Maybe I don't understand how much God loves me, and so I don't bring Him enough stuff. I try to do it myself. Maybe your commitment today is to be a prayer partner with me. Whatever it is, uh, you pray right now. Lord God, thank you <clears throat> that you are God who allows us to pray. We can talk to the God who created all this beauty, created us. It's amazing. Help us to pray to you more often all through the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.